Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Fall Lecture Series at Grey Roots Museum and Archives. I'm your host, Karen Noble. We wish to begin by respectfully acknowledging that our community gathering place is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, and further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, known collectively as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of these lands and these waters. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and friendship with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Today is the final talk of the Fall 2023 series and the second online pre-recorded talk available from the Grey Roots YouTube channel. These virtual talks will remain available for repeat viewing. And now for the presentation of the day, the Meaford Tank Range story. Today's talk is presented by Grey Roots' own Stephanie McMullen. Stephanie has enjoyed a varied career at the museum beginning back in 1999. After earning an MA in history from the University of Calgary, Stephanie worked at the Centre d'Interpretation de la Côte de Beaupré, the Mackenzie King Estate, and the Canadian Museum of Civilization before arriving at the County of Grey Owen Sound Museum. Over the years, Stephanie has worked in historic site interpretation, education programs, program development, exhibit writing and development, promotions, membership, and grant writing. Currently, Stephanie acts as Grey Roots Community Historian, providing research and support for exhibits and programs. An exciting part of her work involves supporting underrepresented communities and facilitating their inclusion at every level of development and presentation. And now, welcome Stephanie. Thanks, Karen. It's great to be here today, and I'm excited about our topic. Today, we're going to explore the roots of the Meaford Tank Range. For so many people in Grey Bruce, we know that it exists, but the story of how it came to be is not so widely known, and it is an important part of our history that has had a significant effect on the surrounding communities. So I'm excited to get into that today. Well, our story starts not in fact in 1942. It starts back in 1939 with the outbreak of World War II. And Canada was in the war from September 10th, 1939, and was a solid support for the British in the first three years of war. Unfortunately for the Allies, things did not go well during those first few years of war. Uh, it actually went very poorly. Uh, in 1939-1940, the famous Blitzkrieg moved through Western Europe and resulted in Nazi Germany controlling nearly all of continental Europe. That was followed by the Battle of Britain in 1940. Many Canadian pilots flew and fought in this battle, which ultimately the British were successful in repulsing the Luftwaffe and uh, staving off a Nazi invasion of Britain, but it came at a tremendous cost. And Germany bombed civilian targets during that time and afterwards in London and elsewhere in the British Isles. And that had a devastating effect on the resources that Great Britain had. But also steeled the British resolve to resist. Canada jumped in in the summer of 1942 and participated in the Dieppe raid in that August. It was a disaster. 5,000 Canadians um, went in that morning to try to take Dieppe. Of the 5,000 who went, only 1,000 returned without being injured, killed, or taken prisoner. It was a disaster and it was a devastation. And that's the landscape that in which our story begins. We have been at war for three years. The war has gone quite badly for the Allies and it seems that we may in fact lose the war 
what Canada realized at this point, as did the other allies, but particularly Canada, Canada realized that we needed better training at a better site in central Canada, particularly for armored fighting vehicles or AFVs. That includes tanks. Uh, what we had at that time was really insufficient, both in terms of the available space for that training and the topography. Um, all of the places where Canadian forces were training in central Canada at that time had fairly soft ground. And so what that meant is the heavy armored vehicles would sink into the ground. So it was not particularly efficient for training soldiers. The northern portion of St. Vincent and, Sol and Sydenham Township did seem to hold promise of a better way to train troops. Why? Well, the land in that area contained, in a relatively small area, contained a variety of landscapes which offered troops the opportunity to train for all kinds of um, missions. So there were floodplains, there were waterfronts and cliffs. There were microclimates along the northeast area. Uh, there was flat plain in the center, which could hold the weight of tanks. It was located close to major roads and highways and railways. It had a communication system in place, specifically the telephone system, and the real estate valuation for the land was fairly low. So those all made it check boxes when the Department of National Defense was looking to establish a new training location. But this land, of course, was not always used for training military troops. It was not always used to farm apples or um, to cut timber for sawmills. The land had been used for generations by the Chippewas of Nawash as part of their home territory. And they cared for the lands and the waters and they used the resources of the area as part of their spiritual and cultural relationship with the land. Half of the area that became the Meaford Tank Range was surrendered in 1818, and the other half was surrendered in 1836, but it was and remains part of the traditional homelands of the Chippewas of Nawash and the Chippewas of Saugeen, as Karen indicated at the beginning. The first non-Indigenous people who came into the area to settle were veterans from the War of 1812. In 1812, the British government promised anyone who fought for the British uh, a certain parcel, a certain amount of land. However, it took them quite a long time to actually parcel out the land to those veterans. The land was obtained in 1818 for that purpose, but because it takes so long and there's such an involved administrative process. Most people simply sign their scripts away to land companies. There are a few, like John Vale, who take up the offer and he comes west along the shore of Georgian Bay and he sets up a home at a place now appropriately called Vale's Point. Um, and he does that in 1825-26. A community slowly sprang up around him and uh, others followed in places like Cape Rich, just down the shoreline. As time goes on, more settlers arrived from England, Ireland, Scotland, the United States and other areas of Canada. And as they established themselves in the area, they start fishing along the shoreline. Um, there's areas where apples grow well, and there are many orchards that are established in that space. There's rich forests, and so lumber is cut and milled in the area. Uh, 
Many families survive on subsistence farming, particularly on the plateau area of what is now the tank range. Other communities are established, places like Morley and Colenso. It also becomes a vacation area, um, particularly on the floodplains and around Mountain Lake. By the 20th century, it's a popular area for people escaping the city and the summer heat to come up to the area. Also, there's an interesting microclimate on, as I was saying, the northeastern shore of the area. And Captain Darling, a World War I veteran, starts an experiment with new fruit trees. And he starts growing plums and peaches and other fruits with success in that microclimate area. For the permanent residents in that zone, a sense of community really develops quickly. People start intermarrying, they go to school together, they go to church together, they organize community activities, and so they become quite bonded. Fun consists of farmhouse parties, violin playing, square dances, picnics, swimming, bicycling, church and school activities, going window shopping in Meaford, and whatever fun your creative mind can come up with. But in 1942, the Government of Canada and the Department of National Defense are very concerned about the war effort and how things are going. And so they send out scouts to assess a variety of suggested areas in central Canada to locate this training area for tanks. It is a, it is a secret mission, um, but if you've lived in a small, close-knit community, you know that nothing is secret for that long. And residents notice a lot of strange activity going on. They see men in Jeeps who are driving randomly through the area. They're taking photos. There's low-flying aircraft. Nobody's quite sure what's going on, but there's a lot of rumors flying. The Department of National Defense decides that the area is perfect for training purposes. Compared to the other locations that they'd scouted, this was the best place to go. And so they start making offers to purchase people's property. Certainly the disaster at Dieppe that August really reinforces that need and the urgency of setting up that training base. Officially, um, LAC Part 1897118P3 expropriated 17,350 acres to create the training base. This included 150 active farms, uh, they needed to close five schools, although only four ultimately closed, two rotary camps, two summer hotels, roads, um, removing upwards of a thousand people and many other seasonal residents from the area. Some people accept those government offers. And they do it for different reasons. Uh, some feel it's their patriotic duty to give up their land to support the war effort. Others feel like they're farming marginal land or they're otherwise just making a bare survival existence. And so this, op this offers an opportunity to start fresh somewhere else. One of the residents who whose land was included in this expropriation commented, and I quote, if Hitler came, we would be getting nothing for our farms. And I feel that to give our farms up is only a trifle compared to those who are giving their lives. Generally, we seem to be getting a pretty fair price. That was Mrs. James McCartney. And she told that to the reporter from the Owen Sound Daily Sun-Times. Certainly no one wants to be considered perceived as a traitor to the cause or as a malingerer. But not everyone is excited or interested even in 
surrendering their land to the government. They refuse for an equally wide variety of reasons. Some of them feel like the lowball offers that they're getting from the government, they don't reflect the improvements that they've made to the site. So Captain Darling, for example, and all of the trees that he brought in, the special trees, did the price he was offered really reflect those improvements? Many didn't think so. They also felt that because they were being offered such low amounts, it, it wasn't enough that they could buy land somewhere else. And frankly, there's not a whole lot of land available to purchase elsewhere. We're in the middle of a war. People are not really engaged in a lot of real estate deals in the middle of a world war. So there's there's just not that much land to buy and they don't have that much money to do it. They also had problems with the fact that the army did not offer to help move them to a new location. They mourn the loss of their community. Um, there are many recorded instances of people crying and feeling like they would never see someone again once they left their community. They also resented the threats of expropriation with no compensation. So um, there were fears that the government if they didn't agree to whatever these lowball offers were, that the government would just take their land anyway. And how is that any different than what Hitler was doing? So the, re the residents who protested how this was being handled formed a coalition to try to fight together as a unified force to get a better deal. However, Things were working against that uh, effort. The time frame was very, very short. Um, they came in June to scout out the area. In July, they started making offers. Residents had to be out by September 30th, 1942. So they are given a matter of a few weeks to get out, to find other property, there aren't a lot of trucks on the road. The army has most of them, and the army is refusing to help them move. Um, there are stories of people having to take their cattle on the road by, by the road and take them miles and miles and miles to the new farm. There's no time to harvest the grains or the apples or the fish that they had planted or prepared for earlier in the season. So they would not be getting any profits from that. They wouldn't be getting their regular income from that. The telephone lines were shut off weeks before the deadline. So even if you wanted to call someone to rent a truck from them, you couldn't because the phone didn't work. And it leaves very, very little time for legal consultation. In the late fall of 1942 and in 1943-44, the Department of National Defense does relent and allows people to come back to harvest those apples and the lumber and the fish. That comes to a screeching halt, though, in October 1944. Charlie McCallum had two sons who had gone with him to pick some apples from their orchard. The boys brought home what they thought was a smoke bomb. It was not a smoke bomb. They f they were playing with it by the stove in the kitchen after supper that evening. And the combination of the heat from the stove and the tapping from when they were playing with it caused the unexploded live shell to explode in the McCallum kitchen. Mrs. McCallum was severely injured and both boys were killed instantly. A military inquiry followed, but it determined that the army wasn't at fault. But they decided that it was far too dangerous for civilians to be on site. And so no more harvesting operations of any kind were allowed on the land. In terms of the intent of the tank range, that is to train soldiers and prepare them to fight a 
effectively and successfully in the war, it was in fact a great success. About 10,000 troops trained there during the war between 1942 and 1945. And because of the wide range of terrain available to train on, they were prepared for D-Day. They were prepared for liberating Holland. The tank range played a key role in making those victories possible. The land or the buildings that were on the site were used to house personnel. Um, they were also used as offices and they were also frankly used as target practice. So by the end of the war, many people's buildings on their property had been altered beyond recognition. The war ends in 1945, um, depending on communication with the troops, the creations tank range could come as a surprise. Um, for example, Gord Bishop, whose family farmed on that land, uh, he spent most of the war in a German POW camp. Um, in fact, Stalag Luftwaffe III, which some people might know as the home of the Great Escape. He came back to Canada at the end of the war only to find out that his family farm was no more. You can imagine the devastation that that would make someone feel. Some families felt that they would get their lands back after the war. This whole thing was just a temporary measure to ensure final victory in Europe. And once that had been achieved, then the houses would go back to their previous owners. That was not in fact the case, however. It was still used as a, an active training site by the Canadian military in the 1950s and into the 1960s. It was mothballed in 1970 and only five commissioners were kept on site to provide some security. This actually had uh, an economic turn down in Meaford because suddenly there weren't all these soldiers coming in and out and coming into Meaford to spend their pay. However, despite the fact that the site was mothballed for military operations in 1970, people are still garnering hope that they can get their lands back, but they can't. Uh, the military does an investigation of the site and they decide that absolutely not. The land cannot go back to private ownership. There is far too much unexploded ordnance on the site and in the nearby waters. And it is also far too expensive and dangerous to try to clean them all up. So for public safety, nobody is allowed to purchase their land back. The site itself is reactivated in the 1980s when the government decides that reserve troops need better training. You actually do need to provide solid training for your reserve troops should they ever go into action. The Department of National Defense, however, was aware of the hardship and the hard feelings that were created by the expropriation in the war. And so they decided to make the site more accessible, particularly to the families who had been expropriated, but to the general public as well. So they do offer public visits and bus tours every year. Before um, COVID, they were usually done in April. And they are responsible for the upkeep of the cemeteries in the tank range zone. And I've seen the cemeteries and they do a good job of that. If a family is one of those who had been expropriated during the war, they have special access and can contact the base commander to make arrangements for that. Nevertheless, there is still lingering bitterness from families who are pushed out against their will. Um, they still remember with sadness and heartbreak 
how they had to leave their land, not by their own choice. They did not feel they were treated fairly, and they had to go almost with no warning. It's a complex legacy. The Allied forces were doing fairly poorly in those first three years of war. And the government of Canada, the Department of National Defense, and indeed most Canadians felt that we needed to do whatever it took to turn the course of the war, to push the Nazis out and gain that final victory. And there's no question that the Department of National Defense needed a better site for armored fighting vehicles because nothing that they had was appropriate for training for that particular style of fighting. And so that land in northern Sydenham and St. Vincent Townships, now the township of Meaford, it fit the bill. It made it possible to train troops effectively for fighting in Europe. And ultimately, the training that they did have at the tank range did contribute to Allied victory in Europe. There are people who wanted to leave. They saw it as their duty to sacrifice. They saw it as an opportunity to start over. And then there were the families who, as I say, felt that the government was acting like a dictatorship in taking their lands away. Uh, and in fact, the War Measures Act, which was activated in 1939, did give the government sweeping powers to support the war effort. So the government could, in fact, expropriate that land and give nothing in compensation. They didn't want to leave their land and their homes and their communities, and they did not feel that they were treated fairly and in an appropriately Canadian way. So it is, it is complex. Everyone is right, and yet everyone can be right and still there is hardship and bitterness that is created. And that is the legacy of the Meaford Tank Ranch's creation. So, um, are there any questions, Karen? Just like to thank you so much for your presentation and for preparing it. Um, I just was curious, you've given this talk quite a few times now. It seems to um, uh, pique the interest. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on why people are so interested in the Meaford Tank Range. I My feeling really is that, you know, we know that there is this military training base right here in Gray County, but it is an active training base, so you can't just wander on site and see what's going on. And you wonder, how did we end up with a training base here? And it's not widely known why it was selected. Um, a lot of people don't even know when it was selected as a training site. And there are also still lots of people around who were there and who were expropriated. And so you have this curiosity, you have mystery, you still have local stories about what happened, but how the pieces all fit together, that isn't as widely known. So I think that that's part of the reason. And would you, would you say that's the question that people ask you the most is why or is there any other commonly asked question? Um, when I've done this presentation before, people ask a lot about when the public tours are. And that's something that you need to contact the base directly about. I'm not sure since COVID how they're handling those public tours. So 
um, you can certainly call the main office at the base and they can help with those kinds of questions. And I have also had the great fortune at a couple of the presentations to have someone there whose family had actually gone through or they themselves had gone through the expropriation process or they lived just outside the range that was surrendered and uh, so there's there's lots of stories that have been shared that way i find that uh it's an area that has kind of has everything it's got it's got so much water access and it's got the uh interesting topography and the fact like 1942 was sort of a bookend um and i was just curious if there's anything that you've tried to research in the time before the expropriation that you're still trying to find out hoping to know if there's any elusive sort of um elusive history um i'm I'm really interested in like the little villages, the little postal stop places that were established in um, Morley and Colenso in particular. I mean, Cape Rich and Mountain Lake are they're beautiful areas, and the lake is gorgeous in the surrounding area. I I have no questions about why a hotel was established there and a summer kids camp. Um, but those those areas that are more in the plateau where it was harder to make a living, um, those areas, particularly Colenso, because it's such an odd name, and I'm I really am not up to speed on how those particular places came to be uh, the community centers. And just one final question. Well, more if you want to comment about the branding on the barrels, because that seems to be something that people are always like, oh. <laughs> that is true. That is true. That branding on the barrels is problematic um, since the Second World War. Um, but the swastika in the inverse direction, like on those barrels, is an ancient symbol of good luck and good fortune. And so that's why it's on the barrels. Um, that picture predates World War I. And so that's where that stenciling comes from. It's really just meant to be kind of a good luck to you apples because they're probably going over to England anyway. Um, but yeah, the Nazis corrupted that symbol and have made it very problematic. Once again, thank you so much, Stephanie. Really appreciate you taking the time to prepare and deliver the talk today. And thanks again. Thank you.